how's everybody doing? So what I want to do with this update or overview is to take you through from a couple of positions on the tripod here and just sort of pan, you know, like across the sections that I've pretty much built. Like none of it's really finished as, as the saying goes, but uh, areas that are sort of primarily done and just talk about them a bit and maybe mention some of the areas I want to fill in. I mean, like, for example, like this area here is, you know, primarily complete in terms of structures, but there's so much detail to go. Right. And then I want to talk to you about a couple of issues down here that happened on this buried rail section. Um, I really like this method. It's a it's a modeling, a pure modelers kind of method. Uh, but I want to talk to you about what happened here and how I fixed that. Okay, um, and then I just want to mention to you down here where I'm at with the end of the barge ramp uh, in terms of the structures there and what yet needs to be done. And since I'm here now, let me just jump quick over to where the brewery is. Just for those of you that are want another look at that and are not familiar with that particular section of the layout on the far end by the door, like where the the uh, rail which is the main line actually that line back there just so you know is the main line and it's actually used to classify tank cars that come in from vancouver island on the barge slip and it's also a run around so it's a it's a sort of a triple purpose line which is important to do when you're on a shelf though you want to maximize your operational opportunities and I think it turned out really good, even though I didn't get the spur in to serve the brewery, which is out of service anyway. But I'll just take you over there just to give you a quick look. Okay, so um, yeah, so that's coming along. So let me just tell you quick what's going on here. So uh, these structures here are almost finished. Like I still have tape on these because they're painted like stainless steel. Like these are these stainless steel sort of brain boxes that operate. Well, there's sort of a, uh, like some of you might know what this is, but there's, there's a sort of an infrared, like these bars here on each side I think they read the placards on the side of the cars. I'm not really sure. Like maybe that's not really still functional. Maybe some of you know about that better than I do. Because I'm not a huge, um, like, like I'm no expert when it comes to railroad operations. I'll tell you that right now. Uh, but that would never stop me from building a model railroad. And it shouldn't. But that's one area that I'm working on. Like trying to learn more about the, you know, the actual logistics of train operations. But anyway, yeah, and then these cylinders that you see here, I don't know if I explained that. Uh, there's these rams that go down. There's an I-beam that goes across the bottom. Like it goes underneath these girders, like at the front, like this, this here. And uh, it lifts the front of this ramp up and down with the tide, okay? When it's linked up with the barge or the ferry, there's this sort of hardware on the front of this with some links and then there's these pulleys on here with cables that they lock it in so that's how that works so what i've been doing here is is you know like i'm moving you know sort of one step forward two steps back you know how it is i've been working from left to right through the linear length of this layout uh these are the sort of the final sort of uh secondary structures there are these little kiosk platforms that mount on each side and as the ramp moves up and down, like these are fixed on the ramp. So they move up and down in front of the ladder here. Right. Uh, this one doesn't have a kiosk or a roof on it, but they both have a sort of control box on them 
This one has a sort of a corrugated roof and some 4x4 four four wood structure, which kind of adds uh, a nice little bit of character, um, you know, that mounts on here. So these are sections that I haven't quite finished yet, and they get mounted on the side like that which I'm sort of cycling back and forth between other things. So it's coming along, it's, it's getting really close. And I just want to uh, put a shout out to, uh, I hope I pronounce his name right, Beno Evelyn. Uh, he sent me the graphics for this. Like I had problems trying to get the font right for some reason here. And he sent me the whole graphic of the meatball head here, Washington Corp, and then SRY, which is Southern British Columbia Railway, and then Rail Link. So when I get around to that, I'll probably make a decal for that and re-enree this. Even though I'm okay with the meatball here in the main SRY. But anyway, he sent me that. So thanks a lot, Beno, uh, Evelyn, for that. So, yeah. So, um, like I say, the rest of this is fairly much done. Um, there's some stuff in behind there, like a backdrop for that alleyway. Uh, there is a Porsche 911 back there now, too. I found a little red one by Burkina Models. Man, that they make really nice 187 vehicles. And it's in behind there by the art studio. Well, the little warehouse that was taken over by the artists, right? Um, yeah, so uh, I'm going to move over to the main parking lot section here now because I want to talk to you about something that happened because you know with model railroads when we use a myriad of, of materials making them all work together you're going to have problems you haven't built a railroad if you haven't had problems so i'm going to talk about that and i'll tell you how i'm going to solve it okay okay so here we are at station two and i want to talk to you about this buried track parking lot that I built, uh, I, I would say about six months ago, I laid this down. And for those of you who are not aware, it's one eighth balsa wood. Okay. And then the center slabs were modeled actually with right angle, like the prototype. And then I filled them with texture paste. Now everything turned out pretty good according to my satisfaction. Uh, I'm really happy with this method uh, for more reasons than one. Uh, number one, it's uh, uh, very light. Uh, number two, it's incredibly stable, like the wood. Like once it's glued down and sealed, it's not going anywhere. And thirdly, uh, if you want to cut into this for whatever reason, like maybe you wanted to put a, a transload building here, you know, or whatever, a platform, it's so easy to do, right? And it won't chip. And it's super tough when it has an acrylic. Like I also flat coated this with, um, like it's not only a flat acrylic, but um, I think I laid on, it was a flat, like I think a matte medium. I can't remember exactly, but anyway, it's all acrylic. Like this whole layout is sealed with like a flat based acrylic, either by way of matte medium diluted in the scenery. You know, it's just really rough or not rough, but just really robust, right? Um, this was all done with washes of Vallejo over Tamiya initially, and then I flat coated all of this with probably Tamiya. So it's super strong and tough. I mean, I've even, I don't like to do this, but I've laid tools on here quite a bit, and there's no scratches. So anyway, so the problem that I had was, was the berry track in the center, like these slabs here. Okay, and I'll talk to you about that for a couple of minutes. I'll tell you what happened. Okay, so I, so there was no problems with the outside surface with the flange or the you know the tire tread on or the tread on the wheel like that was all sanded and factored in uh, if you go back to the buried track section uh chronologically under videos you'll see how i built all this now here's what happened like this was level like the center of this these slabs were modeled in between two right angle pieces of plastic and when i laid it up with the NMRA gauge, the center slab, like uh, you can't have it scrape. Okay. So when you run this through the flangeways, like there can't be any scraping, it has to clear. And I'll tell you why. Yes. Some of your locomotives will run if this slab protrudes higher than the top of the railhead, but some won't. So my MP15 and my SD38 Cato and Atlas, right? Both ran well, but 
the Walther's GP9, one of my favorite locomotives, believe it or not, would not run. Like it, like it would stall, it just wouldn't run. Because the gearboxes are lower than, um, than the Atlas or the Cato. There's not much clearance there. So I use this Jeep 9 to test all my track with. And if this locomotive will run on all my track, then any locomotive will. So I was, you know, a little bit griefed. You know, oh no, i got to scrape all this nice yellow that I painted here. I've got to re and re all this, but I'm glad I did. I, was, I spent half a day on it. I really did. I had to night, like it was a little bit tricky to get it all level again, but, but I sanded it, masked it off, and I got it all nice. Everything runs perfectly now. The silver lining in this is this kind of mottled effect that, I, that uh, I'm going to just turn into weathering on the center slab, which is something that you would never model like meticulously. It just happened through the uh, scraping process and just the sanding. So I'm going to put uh, Vallejo cement and sort of blue-gray washes in here to restore this back to asphalt and it's going to look better than it did before. And I found that the yellow on the main here, this main restriction zone, was too bright and fresh anyway. It looked like it was painted, you know, the day before. And on the prototype there's a lot of wear like down the center especially because this is a transload area. So there would be a lot of wear and tear here. So I I have no problem re and reing this. Uh, the outside I didn't have to touch, but the inside uh, I'll just re and re that. And then these inner slabs as well. So I finally got all this now, and uh, hopefully the climate will dry out more here in Vancouver on the Pacific Northwest coast of BC here. It's just been unreal. Like, geez, last year it was 40 C, and now it's like 12 degrees or something. Anyway, so it's a lot of moisture and humidity might have been the factor that caused this to swell. So it's down now and, and, and it'll probably shrink a little bit, but not much though, because golden products acrylics do not shrink. So I'm really glad that I dealt with that, okay? And also um, I should mention, like I didn't really talk about the Axton building, right? Like in terms of painting it, um, I don't think. What I did was I just spray bombed it with uh, Tamiya. I think it was lacquer, like outside. It was a, uh, um, I can't remember the color, JN Gray, I guess. But I mixed up some colors up there. That's why those are there, because I don't want to lose those. Because those are the weathered colors I'm going to put on there that are just perfect for that color that I took me a while to get. So that I'm going to work over a little bit more too. So what I want to do now is I want to talk to you about this scene, uh, this signature scene, this transition zone. Okay, I'll talk to you about my thoughts about this. Okay, so before I uh, slip over to the right here on this uh, signature scene or transitional scene that, that I'm going to talk to you about in closing. I just want to give you a quick panning overview here. So you can see to the far left of the screen there where the uh, barge ramp head is and past that another foot. Actually it's deceptive. It's longer than you think. Um, that, like this whole scene as you see has been compressed in the longitude sense, right? Quite a bit. Like the actual brewery in behind the tree line isn't even there on the prototype. It's further off layout to the left, right? And as you know, I even if I did have a prototypical turn out there, I'd never be able to service the brewery uh, with this particular layout anyway. So that's why it is what it is over there. And the ferry slip or the ferry facade will be, can easily be, uh, built on sliders that come out from under the layout there with the front part of the ferry or barge for offloading uh, cars and bringing rolling stock onto the layout. But that's for another discussion. So you can see the, the main big warehouse there, like that has been compressed by at least, like I took 60% of that building away. Otherwise it would have been the whole length of that, of that, you know, what you see there. So that was compressed as well in the longitude sense. Uh, the parking lot, the curve here, the big bend that I call it is like that was compressed as well, right? Uh, the curve is pretty close, but it's probably tighter than the prototype 
as it is with model railroads, right? Everything fits in the theater of our mind, but it never fits our footprint. Uh, the parking lot is uh, not prototypical size. It's smaller than the original, so, but it works in this case. And I'm glad I did it. You know, I'm not a fan of filling all my space with tracks, so most of you know that by now. And then you can see with the foreground here, it was important that I, because it's a flat shelf layout, uh, which I'm going to get to here as well. I'll just slide a little more over to the right. Uh, I wanted to lose the flat pancake feel of the topography in the genre of a shelf layout, which can oftentimes be just flat looking, right? But I think I achieved that look or got away from it by adding this scene in here, which I'm going to talk about in a second. So the Axton Steel Building there, or actually, maybe I should talk about that cell tower. That's just a temporary stand, and I haven't finished that corner yet. And I'm not going to until I feel like I'm in the mood for it. So I'll cycle back, one step forward, two back, that kind of thing later on. But that that scene down there, if I can just step down. This I need to revisit some more. But this Axton building here is actually prototypical in size in terms of the frontage. And then that little building is really set back further than than it is on the model. It just, I made it that size to simulate a little more distance. It's, there's another big parking lot between the two. But that's the way it looks when you photograph the prototype. It looks like it's attached to this building. So, And then there are trees back there like that. They're just a little bit smaller. I had smaller trees back there, but it was there's too much open space here. And just since I'm on that topic of this space, there's the, the Alex Fraser Bridge is further back than the Axon building by hundreds of yards. Now, somebody had mentioned, well, you should build that. Right, it would look good from down that way from the brewery, but what are you going to do right here? Just end it right here? Like, it just wouldn't work, right? Like, it won't work from this direction. That's the problem. I mean, I, can, I was going to play around with some ideas when I get around to it, if I ever do, because there's so many things on the production schedule and what I want to do on this layout. So I don't know where I'm going to find the time to do that. But um, that was an idea. But there would have to be structural changes here in order to make that work. Right? Like I was planning on lowering the valance anyway uh, later to hide all this up here. Because I don't need a large viewing aperture here. You never notice the, uh, the fascia valance. Like this opening. You don't notice it when you're operating. It just disappears. So... Now, on the prototype in terms of trees, it doesn't look like this, obviously, because if I was to model this close compressed to the prototype, it would be all warehouse districts. Like Anasis Island is, that's all it is, is scrap yards and warehouses. And I'm not going to devote any more space. Half I've already devoted almost half my space to an industrial district. And I don't want any more industrial district because, frankly, I'm not a big fan of industrial districts. So I'll tell you that right now. Like, I devoted 10 feet to it, and that's fair. And and I like it, but it's it's just not going to happen. I want this terrain to shift now. I want it to be very thematically British Columbia, which is what this does. And then there's the, the New West section, which has lots of areas like this. Maybe not trees as big, but in my area they are. Right by the CN Main Line. I want to have the facade, like the west side of the SRY shops, is going to be down this way. And I have plenty of room to do that. And then it'll it'll veer off the main, uh, and it's going to end with another version 2 Glover Road, like the grain elevator at Milner. Like that's going to be the, you know, the, visual, the visible footprint of the layout. So you have to take liberties uh, in terms of scenery compression. Now, on the original or in the original location, there is a large stand of trees here before the big bridge structure that's massive, the Alex Fraser Bridge. And there's actually trees here on this side, like a huge stand of trees right here. Now, I'm going to revisit this area and see what that might look like uh, as, a, as a block or a divider, you know, to help create a sense of, uh, you know, a more plausible transition zone to this kind of feel or whatever. But I also factored in the option to change this up if I want to, because this moves. This whole piece is not fastened down. The whole thing shifts, right? I mean, I could conceivably move this scene right here. Just a second. 
I could conceivably move this whole scene uh, way, way down, like, like this is halfway right here of my visible layout. If I could move this whole scene down on the very end where it goes up into the sort of mountainous region. So nothing is hard and fast yet, right? Uh, the only problem is, is uh, in order to fill this space, if I do that, I have to take a whole new approach to it. And uh, would I be happy with it, right? It's not whether you're happy with it, it's whether I'm happy with it. Because I have to live with it. So, uh, and right now I can live with this scene right here. I love it. Um, you know, because uh, as you know, SRY did acquire those logging locomotives from can four and I'll be modeling one of those as well excuse me <clears throat>